and this will be the official start. Hello and welcome to the first live session in the first week of ethics, analytics, and the duty of care. We're no longer on the how to take this course segment. We're actually on to the, the real contents. And with me, I've got Bernie here in the uh, Zoom chat and an unknown number of people watching the live YouTube stream, either on YouTube directly or in the course activity center and any number of people following either the video, the audio, or the text transcript, all of which are being made available as part of this. So um, with just one of us, Bernie, uh, you should feel free to jump in anytime you want. Um, okay. So uh, because uh, why not, right? Um, <laughs> Well, so I can I, tell you that um, at our meeting last week, you reminded me of the MOOC I took from Emma. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went back and looked at that. And yeah, it yeah. was you, uh, <laughs> even who uh, directed me to that through a Facebook post. Uh -huh. And uh, it turned out to be a really effective um, course for me. And um, it was all... A lot of it was based on when I when I first saw you a number of years ago, and you talked about you know going out re finding some information or searching something, digesting it or making meaning of it, and then putting mm -hmm. it out. And uh, that's what I've been trying to do ever since. And it's it's been good. It's been good. And I'm I'm looking forward to being in this course with you. And uh, of course, we're busy doing what we do. And I've already read one person's uh, blog post, and uh, it looks like it's going to be good. It's starting for me. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. And uh, I'm committed here because I'm, I'm working on it. Yeah, and there's, uh, I mean, it's been easy so far. <laughs> it's it's going to get a lot tougher. Uh, there's a lot of content in this course. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a MOOC, so pick and choose. And, uh, you know, you don't, I mean, the idea isn't to remember it all. The idea is to, uh, you know, ch change the way you see the world, I guess, is, is one way of putting it, or maybe inform the way you see the world. Um, what I want to do with this session is introduce not just this week, but this course as a whole. So uh, if you were thinking of, this whole course as a book, which you should, because I am recording all the transcripts, so think about that. Um, then you should think of this session as the forward. So it's not the actual content, but it's what comes before the actual content. And what I want to do is set up the course and, and the topic and, and put it into context. And I have slides for it with a provocative title. So I'm not sure how this will show for you, but I do want people to be able to see it. Uh, okay, share. Now you should be seeing that and we should, can you also see the uh, people like myself? I don't know how that'll yes. show you on YouTube. Let's, yeah, I can let's see just, you my, and myself on the right hand and then the search for the social algorithm. Okay, and let's see what that looks like on YouTube. So this it's an experiment. So, <laughs> okay. All of this is an experiment. Every time I do a MOOC, it's an experiment. So, oh, okay. So I see myself there. Interestingly, I don't see you. Maybe when you talk, you're face will appear on the YouTube screen. Perhaps. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. That's what happens. Okay, good. Uh, okay, I can stop that and stop using bandwidth on that. All right. So the scandalous title, well, not really scandalous, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it 
you, this could be a bit controversial if we think about it, the search for the social algorithm. And if you're wondering, yes, that is me in the picture and I'm at Occupy Wall Street, um, almost exactly um, 10 years ago today. Is that right? I hadn't thought of that. Hang on, I'm going to pause the whole presentation to see if that's right, because why not? Um, <laughs> uh, I'm nothing if not consistent. Uh, all right, live streaming. Okay, let's open that up. Sorry about that. I'm just <laughs> looking for it here. I, I had all the images open, so um, because I'm using as images for this, uh, at least some of the images, um, my uh, visit to Occupy Wall Street. Oh, where did they go? Did I close that? Oh, well, it's, if it's not exactly 10 years ago today, it's like within a couple of days or within a year. I might have the year run. It might be, but I'm pretty sure it was 2011. I don't know. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Well, it does matter. Otherwise, I wouldn't be. Oh, yeah. No, I just can't find it. Oh, well. Anyhow, Occupy Wall Street. So, and, and you might not think it, but this course actually does have a genesis in Occupy Wall Street. Um, certainly a lot of the thinking that I've put into the course starts with the thinking around Occupy Wall Street. Um, and the people who were involved in that should know, right, that, um, you know, their, their, their activism had a wider and a longer influence of which this is one of just, just one of many, many outputs. So here we are 10 years later and We've reached a point in history where we don't know how to govern ourselves. And I think we look at what's happening in the U.S., we look at what's happening in Europe, even China, uh, Japan. I could go around the world and point to examples. We're struggling. Uh, we're struggling individually uh, with fake news, disinformation, too much information, uh, information that's triggering, information that um, is oppressive, things we can't say anymore, things we should say now, uh, and all of that in a world that's getting increasingly more difficult to live in, thrive in, and survive in. You know, simple things like uh, the way wages have not kept up to inflation, let alone productivity, the uh, arguments and fights over minimum wage. Um, and there's parts of communities where we're living in a world of Me Too and Black Lives Matter and similar movements around the world. Um, and also at a time with refugees coming in from conflict zones around the world. And as a society, we're struggling with issues of power uh, disinformation, propaganda campaigns, and with the global crises of global warming uh, these days, uh, the global supply chain breakdown, uh, and of course, uh, everybody's recent topic, uh, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that's just three things. There's much more than that. Uh, it's a time of complexity and chaos, right? Uh, it's a time of rapid change, events piling up on each other. Uh, you know, it's like the hurricanes. We're done one and we got the next one coming down the, uh, the Atlantic yeah. freeway. Information literally moving at the speed of light. When an event happens in Turkmenistan, we know about it um, right away or virtually right away. We're, we're in a world of globalization. I mentioned the supply chains earlier. Uh, uh, global information networks. Uh, you know, it's uh, people use the term context collapse to describe it. 
uh, what we say isn't just heard in our own communities anymore. It's heard around the world uh, by people we never intended the message to go to. We're seeing division and polarization, um, you know, left and right, environmental, oil industry, vax, non-vax, uh, you know, and every society, every country around the world is doing this in its own different way. The breakdown of communities and institutions. Again, uh, you know, we, we look at uh, you know, the, the struggles the university has faced uh, over the last two years uh, with the rapid trans transformation of remote learning and, and how do we cope in that sort of environment. But that's nothing, I think, compared to what's coming over the next two or three years after we recover from the pandemic and start to figure out as a society how we're going to pay for it all. And then mismanagement of complex events. Uh, in the uh, Guardian, either yesterday or today, I'm not sure which, they're talking about how the mismanagement of the pandemic in the early days in the UK cost thousands of lives. Of course, uh, in the United States, you know, 600,000 people dead, again, arguably because of mismanagement. So there's a challenge, and it's within this wide context of challenge that this course takes place. You know, the, the topic is ethics, analytics, and the duty of care. But let's not for a minute think that that's all we're talking about. Indeed, as a community, and by community now, I'm talking about the online learning community, the learning analytics community, et cetera, um, our response has been far too limited. And that's why I call it the paucity of our response, the poverty of our response. Uh, our understanding as a community of, uh, shall we say, analytics needs to be expanded much more than it is. Right now we're looking at analyt analytics as a way of looking at how students are progressing through courses to predict outcomes. But we need, we need to think about this much more broadly, using data about students and their activities, mm -hmm. not only to understand and improve educational processes, but to support learning itself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've done a study of the applications of learning analytics and artificial intelligence over the last two years, to three years, uh, we'll see that in the uh, second module, there's a huge range of applications that people don't even touch when they're talking about this. And we're beginning to see in some sources now, the, uh, the, the suggestion at least that we need to think more broadly uh, in terms of what we mean by learning analytics, what we mean by artificial intelligence and education. It's not all bad. It's not automatically wrong. This wouldn't even be an issue for any of us if there weren't a huge upside to using this technology and using it precisely to address some of the problems I've just pointed out. And we haven't, as a community, come to grips with the concept of ethics. Um, we're presenting them as simply rules and principles. Uh, we're focused on a few issues, diversity, equity, inclusion, which, to be sure, are important issues, but do not constitute the broad sweep of ethics. And... We aren't even, I would argue, coming to terms with the changes that have happened in our understanding of ethics generally. Um, it's no longer simply teaching about rules and principles, despite what we might see in the academic response. Uh, Sternberg, who I quote here, says we should be teaching ethical reasoning rather than just ethical principles. But what does that mean? I mean, people can't even agree on what constitutes critical thinking, much less ethical reasoning. 
how do we decide or do we decide what's right and wrong? Are right and wrong even the right concepts that we ought to be applying here? You know, we think of ethics in, shall we say, the old fashioned way of, you know, it's a set of principles for deciding using reason what constitutes a right action and a wrong action. Well, that's a definition that doesn't work anymore, precisely because we live in a rapidly changing, dynamic, complex world. And in fact, the breakdown of the institutions and the social structures that I described are precisely because that kind of reasoning doesn't work anymore. So what do we do? And if you're wondering why I'm always looking this way, it's because I'm looking at your little image, Bernie. <laughs> so me, I, so <laughs> that's, that's why I'm, I'm looking directly at you when I appear to be looking away. <laughs> so, um, and all of this arguably, and, and I will argue shortly, is happening in a climate of change huge sweeping social change that we don't yet fully grasp. You know, it's not just, hey, we've introduced artificial intelligence, now the world changes. It's much more than that. If I had to characterize it in slogan form, I'd say that society is transforming from a tree to a mesh. And Occupy Wall Street in its beginning was pointing out what was wrong with the tree. What was wrong with the traditional structure and organization of society? Uh, we, we can represent it here with this model of a traditional social network. And you can see what, what really is a fairly familiar hub and spoke kind of construction. And we can see that reflected in society as a whole whether it's uh, business and industry, you know, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon might be these hubs, um, or we might think of it in terms of websites. I guess we'd list the same list of websites, um, or in other industries, other major companies, or perhaps global social structures. We have. Russia, United States, China, and then all their vassal nations. Um, and the individuals who are in this network um, are profiting disproportionately. We see in the lower right-hand side of that slide there, a characteristic power law of the distribution of influence um, and therefore also the distribution of wealth in the society and when you have this kind of structure that's the kind of distribution that you receive also when you have this kind of structure it's much more vulnerable to disruption to disruption by pandemic it's not something that occupy wall street was talking about but it was still there as a possibility disruption by supply chain disruption disruption by war and conflict get at the nodes, you can break down society. Uh, control the nodes and you control society. That's why everybody's going after Facebook. I, I heard someone say um, on, um, it was one of Leo Laporte's podcasts on the Twit network, people aren't trying to stop Facebook. Politicians aren't saying, trying to stop Facebook. They're trying to control it. I think that's true. They're working within this structure. And if you can control the node, you can control society to your own benefit. That's the way it works. That's why people were protesting. The alternative toward which we are inevitably moving is a mesh structure. Uh, a mesh structure is the sort of structure that characterizes road networks, email networks, anything peer-to-peer, -peer, anything place-to-place, -place, anything where you don't have to go through the hub to get from one place to another place. It's more distributed. It resembles discussion more than a lecture. It's more balanced in terms of power and arguably 
it's more reflective and more democratic. And I've made this argument in the past and I'll continue to make this argument. And if we look at or analyze power, wealth, influence in a mesh structure, we no longer have the power law. We have a distribution which is much more along the lines of what people when polled think is appropriate, not absolute equality. Nobody, nobody argues for that, but you know, uh, a reasonable range of influence from the most influential to the least influential. You know, instead of one person having millions of times more power or influence than another, they might have 10 times or even 100 times. And people are actually pretty comfortable with that, especially when, and we see the other lines represented on the chart here, especially when people who are in, shall we say, the long tail, or, you know, shall we say, making minimum wage, aren't below the poverty line anymore, aren't struggling to get my, to make a living. So, and we're moving into that organization, but by fits and starts and not uniformly, many of our technologies are already mesh structures. I mentioned the road system, I could talk about the power grid, etc. But they're being managed by hierarchical structures. And there, therein lies the dissonance, therein lies the, the clash of cultures within our system. So what I'm wondering, what I'm studying with this course and other work is what is it like to live in the mesh? We know what it's like to live in a hierarchy. You know, you, you, you follow rules, you do what you're told, you rise up through the ranks. That's how it works. And the mesh is very different. In the mesh, even our values, goals, and objectives change, right? And the hierarchy is pretty clearly defined. So power, money, wealth, influence. But we're seeing more and more different values expressed by different people. How do we know? In the hierarchy, we're just told what to believe. In the mesh, there are no authorities anymore. And you can't just go around picking authorities. And anyways, you know, unless the authorities are in roughly the same position you are, they're going to misunderstand your perspective. Uh, and that's how we get arguments about colonialism and cultural imperialism and all of that. But even more to the point, they'll lie because they're in it for power, wealth, influence, etc. What can we do? What are the practical steps we can take? Uh, what is it like to thrive and, shall we say, live ethically in a mesh? And we're only beginning to learn that. And, and frankly, I am not going to be producing an answer to that question, despite deeply looking at it for eight weeks. And, and that shouldn't be the output. That shouldn't be the outcome. <clears throat> so how do we how do we learn what it's like to live in the mesh? Well, there's two major approaches that I'm going to take as starting points. One of them, um, as suggested by the analytics in the title, is the use of AI and neural networks. And looking, you know, and I'm going to characterize these as, uh, you know, connected sets of entities with inputs and outputs, and therefore an input layer and an output layer. The study of the algorithms that add or strengthen or weaken those connections and related topics such as activation functions, network topographies, labeling. Uh, there's a whole bunch of factors that go into the design of a neural network. And I'm understanding this endeavor as the intent to produce the set of algorithms that produce the best result. That's, you know, that's, that's how they approach it. The, they'll take a challenge like, can you translate a language? Can you translate text from one language into another? And you get the result 
and you're looking for the algorithms that produce the best translation, for example. That's how I'm going to look at it. But also, we have the study of neural and social networks as they exist in the world. And what's important here is, to this point anyways, we don't have the liberty to just go in and start tweaking the algorithm. The algorithm is the algorithm, whatever it is. You know, the brain is the brain, society is society. And so this is the study of these networks in the world. And it includes the identification of the entities, and we could talk about that, uh, we probably will, yeah. is the right identification of entities in society, the individual, the community, the cultural group, the linguistic group, uh, or do we take an intersectional approach and what does that mean for network analysis? It also means the study of network topology, the growth and development of networks, how selective attraction, for example, gives people more power and more privilege in a network, how these hub and spoke networks develop and why they develop and the objective here, kind of, is to explain why the things they are, why the things are the way they are. And that may sound straightforward, but again, and, and you know, the, the previous work of creating the network or the series of algorithms that will produce the best result, these may seem fairly straightforward and fairly simple, but uh, they're, they're not because, you know, there are no easy explanations. There are no easy prescriptions. Things are going to change from context to context uh, in a world where there are multiple simultaneous interacting variables. You can't just give a simple cause and effect explanation anymore. So I'm structuring my work over the next year, not just in this course, but overall this way. So I'm looking at the networks and I'm looking at the analysis, the two subjects that we just talked about. And these resolve into work on the one hand about ethics and on the other hand about literacy. So what we value, what we want, what we desire, what's right, what's wrong, and then how we go about reasoning toward these things, how, how we manage in this world of data to come up with mechanisms that, shall we say, produce the best result, both in computer systems, but also in ourselves and also in society. And is there a way to do that? I don't even know if there is a way to do that. Right think we can approach one. I'm not sure if we can ever ultimately get there. So the work that I've been doing over the last couple of years, um, and this, this is the current snapshot of what that looks like, the MOOC that we're looking at now. Uh, I've been working in a Government of Canada uh, subcommittee on AI and learning. I'm a member of the NRC Research Ethics Board and all that that entails. I'm participating in NRC's Data Equity Working Group. Um, I've been participating in things like the Creative, of, Creative Commons Ethics of Sharing Report, and uh, I've published on ethical codes and learning analytics. So that's the one side of it. The other side of it, which will be next uh, winter, February to March 2022, will be focused on data literacy. And I construe that pretty widely to include data literacy, data management, et cetera. It's, you know, again, it's an equally large topic. I've been involved with uh, DRDC, which is uh, Defense Research and Development uh, here in Canada. I've been involved in something called the FAIRS FAIR Book Project, for finding um, accessible and interoperable uh, reusable resources. Uh, a presentation on what does it mean to enroll in a course and even a series of presentations accompanying this course about how to build a MOOC. 
a uh, thing called COVIDA, which addresses a lot of these topics and even the work that I've been doing in blockchain and consensus. All of these inputs are coming into these two courses. So let's look at that. Uh, when I think of reasoning generally, I think in terms of critical literacies. And this, this is my background as a philosopher speaking here. Not so much as an ethicist, but as someone who's studied you know, how we learn, how we think, how we create. And I've drawn up, I don't want to say taxonomy, that's not the right word, but a set of uh, overall approaches which I'm grouping here into three categories, applications, values, and practices. And we're gonna look at all of these in some detail, but not under these headings necessarily, but this kind of thinking informs the background to a lot of what we're talking about. Uh, the applications are simply the mechanics of how things work. And the mechanics of how things work there's, there's the two sides of that. There's the syntax, which is the mechanisms that are being created by artificial intelligence theory, uh, neural network theory. This is where AI is now. And we have pattern recognizers. Uh, we have uh, systems that spot regularity, systems that classify, et cetera. And then the current issues in AI uh, including things like value, meaning goals, the ethics of AI, reference, what are we talking about? What kind of models in the world are we creating? All of that. Uh, but moving beyond that and where we really need to be thinking for a topic like ethics, analytics, and the duty of care, especially in a learning context, but really in any social context, uh, are the values First of all, how we use these technologies, what kind of actions do we take? Do we persuade, do we interrogate each other or the environment, scientific method, propaganda, all of these things. And also the context in which these applications take place and how we define that, how we describe that. And that leads us to the practices, how we take these things, bring them together to give us a story uh, about how learning inference and discovery happened in society. And so I break these down arbitrarily into cognition and change. Uh, cognition, how we argue or explain things, change, how we you know, recognize and work toward progress and development in society or just spin around in circles, whatever the case may be. So this course is basically here on this slide. Um, it's involving a comprehensive study what ethics actually are and how they're established in our field and maybe generally. So we're looking at the applications, how we apply AI. So, and that'll be module two. And then later on in the course, in the second half of the course, we're gonna be looking at what decisions we actually make when we apply artificial intelligence, analytics, neural networks to any of the applications that we've been talking about. Because we do, we make a series of decisions. Um, people talk about, for example, we need to avoid bias in the selection of the population that we study. Quite so, I agree. Um, but I'm looking at this from the perspective of we are selecting a population to study. What are the decisions that we make when we do that? Because, you know, we're still in old world thinking. We want, you know, bias causes bad results. A nice simple explanation. But the decisions that we make when we're selecting a, a population for a study uh, as input data for a neural network analysis, 
there's a range of those decisions and we need to know what they are. Then we apply the ethical dimension to all of this. Uh, module three, looking at ethical issues. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm nothing if not dogged and comprehensive. And some people do literature surveys where they break down the list of papers into, you know, a small number of methodologically valuable uh, studies. I just inhale everything like a vacuum cleaner. Um, because what's interesting to me is whether something exists. And if somebody raises an ethical issue, it doesn't matter what the context is, that issue exists. Now we can argue about whether it's spurious or not, but the existence proof is simply the fact that here's a piece of writing or an infographic or a video and this issue is raised. So that's what I've done. I've spent the last two years inhaling ethical issues. Um, similarly, with approaches to ethics, this is, you know, and again, the discussions around ethics and learning analytics and ethics and artificial intelligence generally sort of skip over this step. Either they assume that the ethics have been solved. We know what ethical uses of AI are, and we just, just shouldn't do what's not ethical. But I'm going to argue, and more to the point, show, I think pretty conclusively, that these issues are not solved. That the 2,500-year-long quest to find reasons for deciding what's right and what's wrong is an effort that was ultimately a failure and that uh, we haven't been able to find reasons to make these determinations. We can certainly rationalize things after the fact and we've done a lot of that, but the manner in which we actually determine what's right and what's wrong is not a rationalist project. And that leads us to the duty of care uh, the duty of care is a feminist theory that is, has its origins in recent years uh, with the uh, writings of people like Carol Gilligan and Nell Noddings and others. From the perspective of uh, practices, from the perspective of context and especially cultural context, and from the perspective of putting the needs and the interests of generally the patient, but more generally the client first. And there's a whole discussion there. And this is not a rationalist, you know, I, I reasoned out that this is the right thing to do in all cases, it's nothing like that. It's not universal, it's not argued for, it's based on the, well, it's hard to say what it's based on. Uh, the, the intuition, uh, the specifically uh, female capacity and need to show care towards the young, it's been described in some cases, and so on. And I think there is an argument there. I don't think it's specifically a feminist argument. I think we all have our capacity to decide for ourselves or to make ethical decisions for ourselves in a non-rationalist way. And this is a way of approaching that subject. And that leads us to the practices. The uh, ethical codes is what we do now. And so I study that practice closely. I've analyzed, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 different ethical codes and then they're still coming in, right? And I'm still looking at them. Um, and you know, people say, well, no, there are common things about the ethics here that we all agree to. But if you look at these ethical codes, you find very quickly, there is no such common definition of ethics as we've codified it in the different disciplines and in different circumstances. Uh, there's some overlap 
you know, fairness is something that comes up a lot, for example. But what we think is fair varies a lot from one circumstance to another. Similarly with equity, diversity, um, and other ethical values, justice. You know, people think, yeah, uh, ethics should be about justice, but the understanding of justice is very different, not just from one society to the next, but from one person to the next. So that leads us to the question, well, if not ethical codes, what are the ethical practices? And that's the section that I'm gonna to use to finish off the course and take all that stuff that we looked at before and think about, well, how do we actually decide what's right or wrong? What are the processes of this? What do we actually do? And looking at this from this mesh perspective that I talked about, we get an understanding of how we can move from ethics as determined for us by an authority or by an ethical code or by a set of rules to something that we can determine for ourselves as individuals and as a society. That's the objective. Literacy, which it will follow in, Gen or in February, March. I have a similar sort of approach. I've done an analysis of data literacy models uh, and as well an analysis of elements of data literacy. I've looked, I've done needs analysis and looked at other needs analysis for data literacy and for you know things like digital literacy and other kinds of literacy in general, information literacy, computer literacy, even emotional literacy. Um, and then look at the practices. First, how we measure and assess literacy. Um, and based on what we've seen so far, we know that it's not just going to be, can you do this? Can you do that? Literacy is not knowledge of a set of specific facts. It's something else. And in fact, if we think about ethics and think about ethical literacy, uh, that same model can be applied to literacy more generally, I think. And then we talk about enhancing data literacy. How do we become a more data literate society? And even taking about that back to how do we become a more ethical society? But all of that is in 2022. So that's the story. Uh, that's what I have in mind. That's the background. Um, I probably shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> But uh, I can't help myself. Uh, I think the issues are as huge as they get. Mm -hmm. um, the need is as persistent as it gets. And uh, I think there's something unique and of value in this approach that's worth sharing. I like the fact, Stephen, that you say you can't help yourself. <laughs> it, this, where do, you've got this... Uh, insatiable uh, curiosity to, is an understatement almost. And uh, I've noticed that you don't settle for uh, uh, the status quo in technology. You're constantly tr trying out new things and not yeah. uh, settling for just what uh, Google or somebody gives you. You'll use whatever tool, and if the tool isn't there, you'll make the tool, um, which is, I, I can't even put words to that. That's, a, that's uh, one of the reasons I enjoy following you um, is because you got this sort of lifelong uh, <laughs> drive to keep going. And when I'm uh, trying to do what I do with my students, I'm just trying to get them <laughs> slightly, you know, some of them are struggling. Like I, I bought I, an email from one and you're not feeling well, so you're not going to connect with me today. And uh, I think your approach, I'm hoping it's going to help me with that, those students to somehow through osmosis or some other way, catch this virus you have where you constantly, <laughs> uh, constantly seeking stuff out. 
Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not going to be able to solve that particular problem. And, and mm -hmm. but I, I think we know what the story that is that can be told uh, here. And it's not the story of just you and the student. Uh, it's not even a story of what the student should be doing or shouldn't be doing, what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing. Uh, you're both working in, you know, the, the hub and spoke kind of model for learning. Um, but if we think about the perspective of the student more generally, uh, they're not in a hub and spoke. They're in a community, they're in an environment, they're in a culture where calling in like this is appropriate behavior. Now we know that because that's what they did, right? It's John Stewart. No, you can judge what a people think is good by what they do. You know, uh, what they actually say is good. Um, you know, you, you don't need to come up with a version for them. They already have their own definition. And, uh, and that's why an intervention at your level is so hard because you're working against all of that. And, you know, other, you know, maybe in a classroom you can intimidate them <laughs> enough, <laughs> you know, um, but uh, when you're online, you lose that power. And that's what's been happening society-wide as a whole, right? Uh, it used to be, and it still is the case in some societies where, you know, you know we'll just intimidate people and they'll do what we mm -hmm. say. But this is working less and less. Yep. Um, and there are good reasons for that, you know, global connectivity, all of that. Uh, but also, you know, just this consciousness that people just don't want to take that anymore, uh, which I think is a great thing, although it results in your student calling in sick when they're probably not even sick. <laughs> um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. it's so, and that's that's why I say, you know, you can't come up with a solution to some of these problems because there is no solution to some of these problems. And, and the very idea that, you know, our thinking that there's a solution, that's the mistake. Uh, and there's so many ed reform movements and it's based on this sort of solutionism. I guess other people have talked about this as well, but based on this solutionism um, without realizing that no we we're not in this hub and spoke anymore we're not in an environment of authority-based information uh and power transfer it's something different now mm -hmm. but how would you and, and here's the question right how would you at least in part influence that particular uh ethic that that particular kid has, knowing that that ethic is created by and fed by their entire community and cultural surround of which you are a tiny fraction, tiny, mm -hmm. tiny fraction, and not even that important on that child's scale of important things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the best answer I have the only answer I have is to model and demonstrate, mm -hmm. which is where this doggedness comes in. There's yeah. curiosity comes in. And my thinking, you know, is that people see that and the results that that produces. Yeah. Over time, more people emulate it. So, you know, the, the practical if, if I had to offer a practical thing, the practical thing in this case is for that student to be exposed to models of good practice, ethical behavior, et cetera, which as an aside, society is providing exactly the opposite of, <laughs> and therein lies our problem. You know, uh, you know the, the, the sorts of activities that we think we should value everything from hard work, curiosity, persistence, resilience, fairness, justice, equity, all the examples that this particular student who called into your class has are the opposite of that. They're politicians, they're business leaders, maybe even their parents, their friends, 
uh, hopefully not their school, but who knows, right? School's not the most just and equitable place in the world. Yeah. So that's my answer. And, you know, you know, I mean, it's uh, the, the old Clinton thing. It takes a village. It does take a village. And that's the problem. Uh, the village right now isn't really up to the task. Mm-hmm. And we, we can't just will it or give it a set of rules to follow. Mm-hmm. Uh, our change has to be more fundamental than that. Mm-hmm. That's why this is so hard. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's fascinating, but hard. Fascinating is a great word. I like it. Yeah, yeah like they are fascinating. Uh, yeah. So what am I missing? What am I overlooking? What do you want me to do next? I'm supposed to start reading it. I got to dig in. I'm supposed to put a blog post together and a minimum blog post there. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. If, if. How to do it. (laughs) Okay. Uh, If you haven't done a blog post for the first part of the course yet, module minus one, then yeah, uh, you want to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, get your blog being harvested. You know, submit your blog, write a blog post so that it could be included in the minus one. I'll still keep doing, I'll, I'll keep harvesting posts from every part of the course all the way through to the end of the course. So it doesn't mm-hmm. matter how late you started. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, there will be tasks for each part of the course, each module. They'll also come out on Monday. So there'll be one that comes out in your newsletter today and it'll be of the form, write a blog post about your thoughts on ethics and analytics at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, what, what questions do you have? Uh, What, you know, like the example you gave me with the kid who calls in, uh, you know, how does that apply, right? You know, that's the sort of question that should be talked about in the blog post, right? How, you know, how does what we're doing address that? Um, something like that. I haven't actually written the task yet, mm-hmm. well, but it'll be something like that. And it'll come out in today's newsletter. That's, that's the thing with this course too. Like I'm, I'm building it as we go with binder twine and cobbled together code and you know as, as i said at the start many moving parts and they don't always mesh you know yeah sure i could just use moodle but then it wouldn't be the kind of course i want because right. you know it's, it's like back in the early days of connectivism the 2008 course we created the course to model the kind of thinking that we are doing and that still continues to this day and um uh, you know, I'll be getting people hopefully to to do more than just write blog posts, but actually mm-hmm. go out, find things, add things. I plan now. I don't know how much I, of this I can carry through, but I plan to actually take all of these concepts and put them in a big graph, put them in a big network, and see what the relations actually are. So, in other words, to try to do a little bit of network analysis as we progress through the course. And and maybe even if I can possibly figure out how to do it, uh, maybe even do a little AI uh, as we go through this course. You know, tomorrow when I do my video, I'll actually do several video segments, but one of them will be, you know, here are some of the ways I'm already using AI for this course or even just in general. so I'll, I'll probably try to get people to do some of that, right? You know, in, instead of writing your blog post, say your speak your blog post and get it transcribed. Mm-hmm. See, so yeah, I, I should do that. <clears throat> now, it, it's hard because, well, people have free access to otter.ai for the initial short term. So if I haven't tried that, I, can, I should do that. Yeah. Yeah, why not? So, I mean, uh, and, and this conversation and this discussion is going to be transcribed. My part of it, I'm recording here, and I've realized too late that your part is missing, but there's still the Google video 
which I'll eventually be able to get. It takes a little while for the processing. And once I have that, I can create a transcription through Microsoft. Not as good, but it still works. Mm -hmm. So that's what to do next, right? Okay. Catch up on your past activities and prepare for your future activities. And then there'll be readings and videos and such uh, in the newsletter as it comes out. Okay, super. So I hope you're looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope well, you have a lot of time, or I, I hope you have some time over the next eight weeks. I will. I'll put. I'll put in what I can. I'm certain. Good. Spending my lunch here with you, and I. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> me too. <laughs> okay. I yeah. They foolishly scheduled these for my lunch time, and I, I have. I'm a creature of habit. And now I'm totally disrupted because I can't have lunch at lunchtime. <laughs> Don't let me stop you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I committed to do videos pretty much every day at noon. So, because I want to, anyways. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's that's an hour. So uh, I'll let you go and uh, I'll finish my lunch. And uh, thanks a lot for uh, attending. And thank you very much. Better than speaking into the voice. <laughs> very much appreciated. Thank you very much, Stephen. Enjoy.